Hi, I'm Marco Rubio, and this is this week's installment of our constituent mailbox. Just as a reminder, every week we go through our constituent emails and letters, and we pick out three or two that we think are most uh, uh, representative of the kind of mail that we're getting, and we answer them on the air. So we encourage you to send us your emails and your letters, and who knows, maybe next week we'll pick your letter and, uh, and give you some answers. So let's start. Our first letter this week, our first email, it comes from Jesse from Miami, and he write, he's a young entrepreneur, and he writes, He's a 22-year-old entrepreneur in Miami. He recently started a new business running a venture in Coconut Grove. It's been a long process. It took nine months of construction, weeks of sleepless nights, and countless hours of work, but they finally opened and business is booming. As a young guy starting a business, I can't begin to tell you how thrilling it is to bring something from the ground up and see revenue coming in. It's as close to having a child as I've ever had. But in the past nine months, I've been disillusioned by what's happening in both local and national political scene. I feel like every time I turn, I'm being shaken down by some official who wants to hurt us. I don't understand it. I always believed that this was a place where innovation, drive, and creativity was celebrated. Instead, I'm getting pushed into a corner by the local powers that be to give them money. Then I turn on the TV and I see people claiming that people like me are greedy and evil. It's, it has been the only dark spot of what's been the nine most tireless and exciting months of my life. Please defend us because they're trying to desperately to hurt us. Every day I feel more and more like the country that I grew up admiring so greatly is sitting on its deathbed. Well, Jesse, let me tell you that your story is very typical of the American dream. One of the things that frustrates me today about Washington is that we're given this false choice. They're telling us that the choice is between Washington or Wall Street, that the choice is between big business and big government. And they're wrong. That's not what's made America great. What's made America great is stories like yours. And I'm not anti-government, and I'm certainly not anti-Wall Street, but neither Wall Street nor Washington's made America great. People like you have. People that start businesses out of nothing that take their life savings and use it to pursue a dream. And the dream works. And all of a sudden people find jobs and new jobs are created and economic growth happens. The fact of the matter is that our economy and our prosperity is the product of countless people whose stories will never be told, who will never be on the cover of a magazine, they're never going to be on Forbes or featured in the Wall Street Journal, and yet they've created jobs and economic opportunity because they had a good idea and they were willing to work and risk in order to pursue that idea. So what's government's job? Government's job is to encourage that. Government's job should be to make it easier for you to do that, not harder for you to do that. And government's job is not to substitute you. Government's job is to encourage more people like you to stand up and start businesses and create jobs. And I agree with you that a lot of what's happening in politics today is making it harder for people to do it, not easier. Now clearly the political bickering and the finger pointing doesn't help. And I think entrepreneurs like you look at Washington and say, these guys can't agree on anything. And it makes you less confident about the future and quite frankly, less likely to take a chance pursuing your dream. But there are some specific policy measures that are in place that are hurting as well. We have a complicated tax code, which makes it difficult to comply with. Big businesses, they can hire accountants and lawyers to help figure it out. But a small business starting out like yours, it probably hurts you a lot. And that's why we need tax reform. We have onerous regulations that are, the cost of complying with are significant. Again, a big business, they can afford to hire lawyers, lobbyists, and accountants to help figure out the regulations. But a small startup business like yours, they struggle with those regulations. So what you need is a government that provides you certainty. And two of the things we can do to help encourage that are regulatory reform and tax reform. Two things I campaigned on, two things I support, two things we need to do as soon as possible so that more stories like yours will be coming our way. Thank you for what you're doing, Jesse. Our second question comes from Neil in Tampa. He writes about the Cuban embargo. He says, please justify your position on the Cuban embargo. When was the last time you visited Cuba? I was there only two weeks ago and as an American was welcomed with open arms. As you should know, embargoes do not work. History has proven that embargoes do not choke governments. They only hurt people. I can tell you from first-hand experience that the Cuban people, some of whom you are probably related to, just want to buy things like soap and blankets. Why would you deny the necessities from people that have done nothing to you or us as a nation? As a constituent, I expect a real response to my queries, not a canned form letter that so many congressmen and women tend to resort to. Well, Neil, um, here's your real response. Number one, I never visited Cuba. My parents uh, left there in the mid-1950s and were never able to return because of a communist dictatorship. So I've never been there. Number two, I'm not surprised you were welcomed with open arms for two reasons. Number one, Cuban people are extremely friendly and they're good people. And number two, because the Cuban government wants your money. That's why they welcomed you with open arms. And here's why they want your money. It's not to help the people of Cuba. On the contrary, they've arrested more people this year for political reasons than at any other time in recent memory. The reason why they want your money is to pay for all that stuff. How do you think they fund their repressive regime? 
How do you think they pay their political police to arrest people? How do you think they pay for all the intelligence apparatus that they use against our government and against our interests around the world? They pay for it, a lot of it, from money that we send from this country and money from visitors like yourself who travel to Cuba and pay exorbitant fees, and then that money goes right into the coffers of the Cuban government. Now, I know that's not why you went, but that's why they want you there, and that's why the Cuban government welcomes you with open arms. Now, let's talk about the embargo for a second. Because you say the Cuban people are struggling economically, they are. And you know whose fault that is? It's not the U.S. or the embargo. It's the incompetence of the Cuban government. A government that was subsidized massively by the Soviets and now is subsidized by Venezuela. They can buy soap and blankets and all these other products from any country in the world. They can buy anything they want from Canada or Mexico or any country that will sell it to them. The reason why they can't buy it is because they have no economy. Because the people running Cuba, number one, are communist, and communism doesn't work. And number two, they're incompetent. They don't know what they're doing. And they've ruined the Cuban economy. There is no Cuban economy, not because of the U.S. embargo, but because the leaders of the country are incompetent. Now, here's why we need a U.S. embargo. Because at the end of the day, the economic system that Cuba chooses is up to the Cuban people. They get to decide that. What the Cuban people deserve is democracy. Why is Cuba the only country in the Western Hemisphere that doesn't have elections? Even Venezuela under Hugo Chavez, either, even Nicaragua under a former Sandinista, Daniel Ortega, has elections. Why can't the Cuban people have elections? Why can't they have the same rights that you have? They're no less worthy of it than I am, you are, anybody else's. So what can we do to help bring elections about? It's very simple. It's very, very simple. When the Castro brothers are gone, someone's going to take over. And if they want to have a relationship with the United States, they need to have a democracy. And so the only leverage we have is that embargo. And so that's why I'm in favor of the embargo. And that's why I hope that we'll continue to have our embargo on Cuba and that we'll stop sending money to the Castro government that they use to oppress people who all they want is their freedom. Thank you for your email. And, uh, and finally, our third email comes from William in Jacksonville. And it's regarding political nonsense. He writes, I'm writing again to ask to do whatever possible to stop the partisanship in Washington. The Republican prom Party promised a break from this sort of politics as usual, yet I just read that the White House has been subpoenaed for something as ridiculous as records regarding Solyndra. Why at the same time Congress is take, taking on the monumental task of voting on our national motto? There is far more important work to do than engage in such political nonsense. I implore you to help your constituents and get on to more important business such as improving our economy. Well, William, I share your frustrations often. You know, I'm here in the United States Senate, which is not controlled by the Republicans, it's controlled by the Democrats. For more than half of this year, we did nothing. Uh, the Senate leadership, which aren't of my party, brought no major bills to the floor, no jobs plans, nothing serious. A bunch of votes on judges and some other things, but no movement on job creating type measures. In fact, they didn't even deal with the debt limit till the very last second. And a lot of that is still going on now, deliberately bringing to the floor so-called jobs bills that they know have no chance of passing for the purpose of political gain. Now, Republicans are guilty of that, too. Both sides are. And people are tired of it. I know I am. I've only been here 10 months. To, to, to me, none of this stuff is normal. To me, none of this stuff is acceptable. I have consistently said I will work with anyone, Republican or Democrat, that is serious about getting this country on the right track, especially when it comes to economic growth and development. Next week, I'll be announcing something exciting, and that is my work on a bipartisan piece of legislation, which is a jobs bill. Now, listen, I'll tell you right up front, it isn't going to solve all the jobs problems that America faces, but it's a good start. And what it basically does is it takes all the ideas that Republicans and Democrats can agree on and passes them. Let's at least work and pass the things that we agree on. And then the things we disagree on, well, that's why we have elections. That's why you get to choose who the next president of the United States is going to be and which direction our country should go. So stay tuned for that early next week. I'm excited about it. I hope you'll be supportive. And I hope it'll be a positive step away from some of this nonsense that I'm frustrated by and clearly you're frustrated by as well. Well, I want to thank all of you again that wrote us and emailed us in the last week and continue to send that stuff. We read a lot of them. Uh, we read all of them. We pick a lot of them, and then some of them are narrowed down for this broadcast, and then we pick two or three, and, and, I, um, and I read them on the air, and I answer them for you. Once again, thank you for the blessing and the privilege of serving you here in the United States Senate. May God bless all of you. May God bless the state of Florida, and may God always bless the United States of America.